I'm Patty Whistler, and I've moved to the district in 1963 when my husband joined the faculty at the University of Washington. And we were from Berkeley, but we lived in France and in Montreal before we came to Seattle. So it was really like coming home in a lot of ways, except it wasn't because it, it, it seemed very, very different <laughs> from, from, from Berkeley in a lot of ways. Uh, th there was a, a sedateness, a, a kind of a politeness, uh, a lack of, in, in some ways, a lack of spontaneity that we felt was expressive, perhaps, of the Scandinavian background of Seattle. But then we realized that if there is one place in all of Seattle where things were going to be volatile and, and people had strong feelings and people argued about things and people got out and, and uh, expressed themselves, it was in the university district. And that was one of the reasons why we were very glad that we moved here. And in Montreal, uh, my husband had had a long commute on a train, and we found that utterly objectionable and no way to live at all. And so it was marvelous to come to a campus where you could live just a few blocks from your laboratory and, and work, take a nice walk home, go back at night if you needed to, and to feel that, that it was part of a community that was campus-centered where you could do everything. You could ballet classes for the kids or swimming lessons or um, anything that you needed in the way of dish towels or underwear or anything you could purchase on the app. It, it was really the, the all-in-one community that made it just a delightful place to live. And the kind of people who lived here were more interesting even than the, the social structure, the uh, uh, professors and, and people who who just simply hung out, uh, artists and writers, and and then just plain old people who work for a business and raise their kids in that place, and, and people who, as we've spoken of before, have lived there for generations and generations. So it, the diversity of people was magnificent, and uh, the Girl Scout troop that my daughter belonged to was made up of different kind of kids. It was wonderful. It was just a, just exactly what you would want if you were trying to design a computerized neighborhood that you want to bring your kids up in. Then as the 60s were on, the, the app itself became a little bit changed. And the stores were still abundantly full of wonderful clothes and, and wonderful things from the world around. I think it was the only place in Seattle where you could find imports in the scale that are very, very familiar to us now. But it's where people came from all over the area to find just the right kind of tea or the right kind of um, kimono or, or the wonderful things that they had at La Tienda from Latin America. So you could eat from all over the world. You could shop for things from all over the world. You could hear people speaking languages from all over the world, and that was, in Seattle at that time, still a wonderful asset. Kids, I think, were attracted to the area because it was so different from Bellevue, and, or so different from Ballard, or so different from, from West Seattle, and so there was always a turnover of, uh, of people who didn't belong here who may have had a tendency to get into more trouble than the people who actually lived here and knew how to cope a little bit better. But still, the, the, the businesses flourished, nonetheless, and uh, when the high tide of activism and of uh, student unrest and the uh, concern with civil rights and with the Vietnam War became more and more um, a, 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 a demonstrable movement in, in the area in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, businesses, I think, began to be a little bit more discouraged about attracting a clientele from all over the city because a lot of people who, who lived places that were very, very quiet found the kind of people that they, they encountered on the Ave and the kind of things that happened on the Ave were 
things that they were not comfortable with. We formed the AV group to kind of to study the situation, you know, the same old rigmarole that you go through and figure out some ways that we could change things. And no matter what we were talking about, whether it was social services or whether it was uh, uh, transportation or whatever, it came back to the fact that we had the narrowest sidewalks in Seattle. They were the most heavily populated sidewalks in Seattle, barring downtown. And people just didn't feel comfortable. Uh, the sidewalks were old and full of cracks and full of holes, and they, you had to really look, make sure you didn't break a leg. Uh, it, it physically, it was a very unattractive and inconvenient and da well, not dangerous other than than spraining your ankle, but but it it was not a happy pedestrian environment. So we thought, well, the first thing to do before we looked at all the bigger problems of what kind of businesses would prosper here or, or what kind of services we should provide was to fix the actual structure of the app, to widen the sidewalks if possible, to redo the lighting so that in, in the evenings there, the sidewalks would be lit, so it's not the, the thoroughfares for cars, to... Um, invest in some street furniture that would make it more lively to give the place a personality other than one of just grim desperation. And so we spent about 10 years convincing the city that this was worth doing and that was finished in 2003 or four, I think it was. And everybody said, well, that isn't gonna change the social climate. It's still, no matter how much you throw at the structure of things, and it was about $8 million, no matter how much money is spent, it's still going to be full of people that, that need help, people that prey on those people who need help, and it's not going to change very much. And so I think a lot of us said, well, that's true. But in time, uh, there may be uh, increased confidence on the part of businesses to make further investments, and I think that's what's happening, and I don't think that we can really tell how much of a payoff that investment will show for another another 10 or 15 years. I mean, it, it, it's such a gradual change that you don't um, say, oh my God, you know, the apps are a wholly, wholly different place. It's not a wholly different place. We don't want it to be completely different. We don't want it to be like University Village, but a place where everybody can feel at home and where street kids can feel safe and where little kids can feel like there's lots of fun to be had and that pedestrians really enjoy walking up and down and seeing what's new. So I have a friend who lives on Chestnut Street in San Francisco and every time I'm down there I think, oh, this is exactly what the app should be like. And, I mean, everybody knows everybody else's dog and, and kid and I mean, here they are in the middle of a huge city and yet it's so, the atmosphere is so friendly and so welcoming and so warm, and you just feel like you're in a little teeny tiny town. And, and that's, I think, what would be wonderful if we, if we could stimulate here.